Hello, my name is Julia Streets and welcome to Diversity Podcast, talking about diversity and inclusion in financial services. On the podcast, we seek to shine a light on positive progress, call out areas requiring further focus and offer lots of ideas to help drive change. And today I'm joined by Jane Welsh and Marissa Ellis. Jane Welsh is an independent consultant and a founding member, project manager and board member for the Diversity Project, co-leading their gender work stream. Jane started her career at the London Business School before moving to Russell and then on to Watson's, now Willis Towers Watson, rising through the ranks to lead the indexation research team. She served on the executive committee for the investment consulting business with additional responsibility for oversight of the firm's inclusion, diversity and leadership initiatives. Jane, welcome to the show. Thank you. Marissa Ellis is a strategy consultant, business advisor and the founder of Diversely. Her experience has included working with blue chip companies, startups, accelerators, fintech digital innovation, service design and financial crime compliance. And at the end of 2017, Marissa founded Diversely and created The Change Canvas to help engage more people in a diversity and inclusion conversation and to provide a framework to accelerate progress. Marissa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Julia. As always, at the start of the show, we invite all our guests to take a minute to tell us what they're focused on. Jane, let's start with you. So the, I'm working on the Diversity Project, which is an industry-wide initiative for the investment and savings industry to try and create a more inclusive place for people to work. So it's about sharing best practice and it's about working on initiatives that will make a difference. Fabulous. Beautifully succinct, may I say as well. Wonderful. Marissa, let me come to you. What are you working on? Thanks, Julia. So as you mentioned, um, through my organisation Diversely, we've created something called the Change Canvas, which is a simple but powerful framework for helping organisations to drive change. And our focus at the moment is really around extending the reach of the canvas. So it's being used by accelerator programmes, large organisations, small organisations, um, d and practic- practitioners. It's also being used at events. It's being used at workshops. It's a great way for strategy development and action planning. So our focus at the moment is about extending the reach, but we're also now working on the next level of detail to really support organisations with that change. So what does good look like? What does that framework of potential change look like? And how can we help organisations to accelerate that change? And I've been really looking forward to this conversation because it's it's a blend of the high level, let's drive change across the industry, along with the, the practical, which is wonderful. Um, Jane, you were saying about kind of where, where a diversity project started from. And and I'm mindful, of course, it, it's it's wide reaching, its work as well. Tell us about um, how did it come about and, and what are you seeking to achieve? So it actually came about as a result of a lunch I was having with a lady called Sarah Bates, who is a, a chair of St. James's Place, and a lady called Alexandra Haggard at BlackRock. And this would be December 2015. And we were having a very nice lunch and we got onto the topic of where have all the women gone? Because we had a sense that earlier on in our careers, there was a high proportion of women in senior roles than there appears to be now. We can't prove that because we don't have the data, but we just had a sense that we hadn't moved in the right direction. We then got on to wondering whether we would even get a job in the industry these days, both because of the way that uh, companies recruit, the kinds of universities they go to, the kind of courses they focus on and the hoops that they expect students to jump through but also the image of the industry. And we worried that that was perhaps putting off diverse talent from applying. But we then had a more positive thought, which was we knew that individual firms were doing some fantastic work around inclusion and diversity and thought, wouldn't it be great if we could share that knowledge so that we could raise the game for the whole industry and also perhaps work on initiatives that no one firm could do on its own. And that's really... The diversity project. And I love this kind of notion of combined positivity, really, because as you say, that there are lots of pockets of really positive change. C- can I just ask you, in terms of where did you see the the greatest areas of positivity and where did you see some areas where people said, actually, we're, we're, we're just a bit op- a bit pessimistic about this, actually, but let's, let's focus here. Well, I think there have been lots of initiatives around gender 
not always successful, but there's been a lot of focus and a lot of talk about gender, perhaps less action than, than we'd hoped. But there were whole areas where people were just not having a conversation at all. So ethnicity, disability, neurodiversity, all other dimensions of diversity weren't being talked about at all. And we want to raise that conversation, we want to encourage a conversation about what does it take to be truly inclusive, rather than focusing in on just one dimension of diversity? And, and how, how does it structured? Because you're, you're the co-chair or co-leader of the gender work stream, as I understand. H- how many other work streams are there? We've got 14. Um, so lots of different groups focused on different dimensions of diversity. But we've also got a series of groups that are focused on different career stages. So, for example, we've got a group that's looking at early careers. How can we attract more people into the industry and create the environment that they want to work in? We've got another group that's looking at returners. So if people take a career break in the investment industry, it can be very hard to get back in. Um, so how can we... Inc- make it easier for people to get back into the industry. So we have a whole bunch of different groups focused on particular dimensions. And I, and I always love it because it, it takes it takes a sort of light bulb moment almost for people to begin to realise that there's that there's a there's an opportunity out there. But of course, it takes a it, it almost takes a village for other people to step up and run so many different working streams as well. And and, and Marissa, what, let me bring you in at this point because you know I mean you as you always say to me, you, you had a light bulb moment when you said, yeah, "I've got to do something about this. There needs to be initiative." Talk talk us through what was the, the driving dynamics at the time. Sure. So I guess when I talk about a light bulb moment, the reality is there were actually two switches that went on in my mind. The first was recognising that there's a problem. And the second was stepping up and saying, I'm actually going to do something about this. And I think that we have to recognise that we're all on a journey. And I think those light bulbs are kind of going off in other people's minds um, at different points in time. And it's really around trying to you know, encourage that so we can shine a light for more people to, to take action. So what happened for me, um, I blame everything on this one event that I went to at the end of 2017. And I turned up and as a woman in fintech, I was surrounded by white men. And as a woman in fintech, this wasn't unusual. There was nothing strange about this. I'd spent my career being surrounded by wh- wh- white men and I've had a wonderful career. I've had a you know fulfilling, I've felt supported. But there was something about this event that resonated for me and something clicked into place. Um, now, the reality was that it had come at a time in my life when I'd been doing lots of reflection in terms of personal impact and what I wanted to do. So there was a lot going on in my mind. It had also come at a time in my life when I had emerged from the crazy world of juggling young children and work, which for any listeners out there who are doing that, huge respect for you. It's it's a it's a minefield. And I'd I'd got to a point where my children were slightly older and I had a little bit of headspace. So I was sort of thinking about what the potential could be. But I was also very aware through my own personal experiences about what the challenges are. So having that insight in terms of the, these challenges um, and the potential opportunity just made me, made me think that actually we need to do something about it. So I started thinking about what that what that could look like. Um, I was also very conscious about the different experiences that my children were having based on their gender, and all of these things sort of came together. Um, and I thought, do you know what? It's it's time actually to recognise that not only am I a leader, a manager, a coach, a mentor, I'm actually a role model and I actually have a responsibility to inspire other people who m- may not consider, you know, a life in fintech, a life in technology, a life in financial services, that actually there is an opportunity there. There, there is a great career that could could be had. And I feel that, hope I hope that through sharing my story and through the, the very practical tools that I'm creating, I will hopefully... To make some small step in in you know the mass of of um, change that is happening to to inspire people to to either join the industry or do more within the industry to make it more diverse and inclusive. And I think this is uh, sorry, Jay. You, it seems like you wanted to come in there. No, I, I just think we, that we share a lot in common. That actually this is about sharing best practice. It's 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 encouraging the whole industry and individual firms and individuals to step up and create a platform for people's voices to be heard. Absolutely. And when I was listening to you speak earlier, Jen, that something resonated there with me in terms of the canvas that I've created. It's all about a shared framework, and it's all about coming together and sharing best practice and ideas. This isn't about. This isn't. I, I do a lot of work in the compliance world and. 
in the compliance world, a lot of the time organizations are coming together because they recognize that actually you collaborate, you, you achieve more. So I think it's very much about that and creating the right environment to to enable that to happen. And one of the things we, we think a lot about on the show is uh, about how does the financial services industry project itself to the outside world? You know, if, we, if we're going to compete for talent, you know, do, do we arguably attract the skills that we need today and, and tomorrow? And, and I'm very interested in, because you've both come from very strong sort of organisational uh, development uh, backgrounds, if you like, I, either in-house or actually in your, in your sort of consulting uh, careers today. And I'm really fascinated in your views about how workplace culture has changed. I mean, Marissa, you, you started by, by sort of talking about, you know, family life and the career journey. And then Jane, you were talking about some of those work streams going through the career journey as well. Um, do, do you see that workplace culture has changed? Well, I think there has been a change in the 30 odd years that I've been in the industry. It is less hierarchical, it is less deferential. But I don't think the industry, and by the industry I mean asset management and investment consulting, those are the bits that I know best. I don't think it's made the strides to be um, more modern as perhaps some other industries have. So attitudes towards smart working or flexible working, I think we've got a lot to learn from other industries. Um, I think collaboration is still a relatively unusual concept. There's still a, a sense that we're all competing with each other. But in this area, I think we, we by working together, we can be more powerful and can affect more change. So I think there's still work to be done to create the modern workplace, which will attract the, 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 the talent of the future. And, and it's quite interesting because I think the, the conversation around diversity is driving the collaboration that perhaps might, if we talk about the reasons to be sort of cheerful, might be a driving force to drive greater collaboration in other areas as well. Uh, Marissa, what, what are your thoughts around kind of organisational cultural change? So I think there has been some progress and I, I, I sit in an interesting intersection because I'm within the financial services with, you know, very large organisations, but I'm also in the sort of startup world with much more, you know, smaller dynamic organisations. And I think in both of those worlds, I think there has been some progress in terms of flexible working and I think flexible working can do a lot. I think some organisations say they're flexible, but it turns out they're very far from flexible. Um, but I also think that there is a, there's a long way to go. Um, I think that organisations in terms of collaboration with fintechs and um, large organizations, they're starting to have to do that for business benefit. You know, so fintechs are much more innovative and can move quickly and they're coming up with all this wonderful technology and large organizations need to leverage that. So, you know, I've been having conversations with organizations about using the change canvas, not for diversity and inclusion, but to facilitate those conversations about collaboration and how we can all work together. And I, so I think that there is this growing appetite to, to, to change but I also think that there is a, so if we move back to the diversity and inclusion space, I think that there's this, the will is increasing, but there's still a, a lack of, well, what is it that we're going to do? So I think, I think in, in my view, it's a sort of simple equation, you know, awareness plus intent equals change. And I think that the awareness piece is growing. I think that it's not just because I've suddenly become um, active in this space that I am hearing more conversations, you know, like when you break your leg, you suddenly notice everyone on the street's got a broken leg. I don't think that's what's happening. I think that there is a, you know, an increased discussion on, on the topic. Um, and I think the intent is, is changing as a result. I think that the drivers for change are becoming much more around, well, this is not just the right thing to do for equality. This is the right thing to do for business. There are huge business benefits of doing this. And I think that's what will drive the change. If we, if we talk about why this is a good thing to do for business, for to to to, um, to realise the business benefits, and and I'm wondering whether that is going to be a compelling reason for people to stay engaged in the diversity and inclusion. One of the things that I'm I'm sort of concerned about: are we running a risk of uh, there are flare moments like Me Too, for example, and the President's Club, and uh, how do we keep the conversation going in a way that remains resonant and relevant? to people in the business world to be engaged in the diversity inclusion conversation? Well, I, sh I share that concern. I, I think there is, uh, I think there is awareness and I think there is intent, but the senior leadership of organisations have got a lot on their plate. There's increasing regulation, there's increasing pressure on the industry in all sorts of ways. And I worry that the diversity and inclusion piece will be squeezed just because of the capacity at the, at the top. 
And in the middle of organisations, which is often where some of the challenges lie around line manager behaviour and attitudes, they've got a lot on their plate too. So I, I, I think it's important that organisations create some space to allow the focus on inclusion and diversity to kind of play through because it's going to take a long time. It is not a quick fix. And are you, are you aligning the conversation with the commercial reality? So for, so, for example, at one end of the spectrum, going back to the world of fintech, it's very easy to talk about uh, diversity in the context of agile working and agile practices around building technology because you need to have diversity around a central problem in order to build it, break it, challenge it, fix it, measure it, hone it, et cetera, in order to be able to bring products to market faster. So so it's interesting when you talk to fintechs, because they tend to, to a degree, sort of say, yes, we get it, because that's exactly how we're going to compete and thrive. But in larger organisations, I think my, my personal view is that we need to align it much more keenly with the commercial realities of what people need to do. Do you think we're close to achieving that, or are we still miles away? I think there is a, an increasing sense that in order to really understand what's going on in markets and to make sound investment decisions, you need different viewpoints. You can't have everybody who's come from the same university, studied the same degree, followed the same path, because they will not spot the risks. So I think there is increasing awareness of that. But I met somebody only the other day who said, oh, I only recruit physicists into my research team because they've got the analytical skills I'm looking for. And I had to really challenge them to say, but isn't that dangerous that perhaps you do need different voices, different perspectives if you're going to avoid major mistakes? So I think there is awareness, but when it comes to actually recruiting people, there is still a danger of recruiting people in your own image. And, and so it's not necessarily being put into action. And and uh, some of the things uh, we're often questioning on the podcast is about the, the the dynamics that would accelerate the pace of change as well, and and I and I in my mind kind of alignment with a commercial ambition is is one of the things where people go okay no I get it there's going to be a commercial imperative or commercial benefit do you see any other uh, contributing factors in the industry that are going to drive that and accelerate that pace of change I think you can take quite a simplistic stance and say, if we're going to drive change, if we're going to accelerate progress, it's about more people doing more things. Um, and if the pace is dictated by the DNI experts who are trying to drive change versus there's tone from the top in organizations saying, this is really important. We genuinely believe in it. People within organizations are not only empowered to drive change, but they they want to drive change. They're educated so that they understand the benefits. I mean, one of my my biggest bugbears, and I guess one of my inspirations for starting Diversely, is that why have I become knowledgeable about a subject that through my own experiences, why was when I was learning about business development, I was learning about product management, I was learning about you know how to grow businesses. Why was this not a fundamental part of the the, the education and now that I am in, now that I can't think in a different way, every time I'm part of something, I think about the perspectives of the people in the room. I think about the, 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 the blind spots that we might have. And I think that if we can embed that as a sort of fundamental business skill, then I'd really think that we're not just, you know, asking the minorities and the experts to drive change. We're asking everyone to drive change for the benefit of everyone. And I think that's really where the opportunity lies. I think there are a couple of other things going on as well, particularly in this industry. First of all, the regulator is taking a larger interest in this. They're looking for diversity um, and they want to know what organisations are doing. Um, the government, obviously, with things like the gender pay gap, the ethnicity pay gap may come through. That's a, an additional pressure to take this issue seriously. And then the clients are asking more questions. So the asset owners are also asking more questions of what are their fund managers and consultants doing around diversity and, and indeed the underlying companies that they invest in. So I think those are additional pressures that will help push this yeah, forward. Yeah, I completely agree. I think more and more organisations and individuals within organisations, because of this raised awareness, are saying, well, well, actually, what does this mean for me? And then, you know, suppliers are starting to become more, more demanding. And I, th I think the regulation in terms of the pay gap, that drives the transparency in terms of the data, you know, one of my, again, because of my background in data analytics, one of my sort of biggest passions is, well, let's use the data to inspire the, the decisions that we make. So I, I do think there's a sort of a melting pot of, of many things coming together. So let's take a moment there to invite Robert and Cynthia into the discussion with some research that they found. 
In 2018, the UK Financial Conduct Authority published Transforming Culture in Financial Services, a discussion paper containing a series of essays from industry leaders, practitioners, academics and regulators. The paper covered four themes. Is there a right culture? The role of regulation in managing culture? The role of rewards, capabilities and environment in driving behaviours? and driving cultural change. The paper calls on firms to use behavioural science to guide incentives and cultural change, and to look beyond the role of leadership in affecting change by also looking at the role of middle management. Many of these areas are frequently discussed on this podcast. Across many industries, the percentage of women in senior roles is declining globally. According to research by Catalyst, a global non-profit helping to build workplaces that work for women. In 2018, women held 24% of senior roles globally, down from 25% in 2017. 25% of global businesses have no women in senior management roles. The industries that don't have women in leadership roles include manufacturing, energy and mining, software and IT services, finance, real estate corporate services and legal. Thank you, Cynthia and Robert. And links to the research can be found on our website, www.diversitypodcast.com. Remember, that's diversity with a C, not with an S. And that's where you can find all our episodes and sign up for early notifications of future recordings. Please do follow us on Twitter at DiversityPod. And Diversity Podcast is also available on Bright Talk and across the women's radio station. So, Marissa, you were just talking there about data, and I know, Jane, you came armed with lots of data. So so why don't you share some with us? Well, uh, last year, New Financial did some wonderful research, a meta-analysis of the research out there on diversity within the asset management industry. And they identified through a number of different studies that underlay that, that, for example, only 1% of fund managers are black, and that compares with I think 40% of the population of London being uh, black or or, um, BAME. And uh, the fact that only 4% of funds in the UK are managed solely by women, whereas 85% of funds are wholly run by men, the rest by mixed teams. Um, So we've got a long way to go. And that data really focuses the minds of of senior leaders. Uh, This is a data-driven industry and presenting the data really does focus the mind. And and, and actually, that's a beautiful sort of link back to you, Marissa, because you were saying earlier about, you know, kind of embedding the diversity conversation almost as a critical success factor of driving change. And I know you think about this from a project manager's perspective or a project management perspective, uh, and data must be at the core of that. Absolutely. So I think my influence is a lot around product management and product management is all about finding that unique offering for customers that meets their individual needs. And to do that, you need to understand your customers. And I think that there is an analogy in the DNI world around understanding your employers. And I think that there is so much that can be learned from the product management discipline. And I think it really falls into three categories. One is around data and using data-driven insights. I think People analytics is an underutilized space. I think that there's more that can be done in terms of using the data we have to to drive decision making. I think another area is empathy. And that is, for me, connected to this concept of employee experience. So if you look in the product management world, you've now got you know, new jobs that didn't exist, say, 15 years ago around customer experience or user experience. And all they're focused on doing is understanding need and understanding, building empathy and and then creating solutions that absolutely meet those needs. And I think if we can understand our employees and understand their needs and recognize, for example, that men and women generally have a different relationship with confidence. So let's build that into the way that we support them. And I think the third area that you, we can take from product management is this a concept of the roadmap, um, the idea that we can't do everything tomorrow. We, it, you know, it's a, it's simply impossible. So you know, the the analogy is you, you need to eat the elephant in chunks, and you build your roadmap by by prioritizing. You understand the needs of your different stakeholders, and you build a roadmap that takes you out into the future. It's you, you define your long term goals, but you have clear things that you're doing each month to get you in the direction of, of where you want to go. 
Uh, I completely agree with that approach because, uh, again, going back to that new financial research, what they found was by talking to diverse talent in the industry, there was a mismatch between the barriers that they experienced in progressing in their careers and the initiatives that many organisations were pursuing around inclusion and diversity. So by listening to the people who were affected by the issues, we can create a better roadmap. And, and, and I think that the truth is the voice will always come from the people who are affected, arguably. So so hearing that, some of that come through. But then I also think about the, no, the enormity of your challenge, Jane, because you were saying there are 14 different work streams. So so there, I mean, the roadmap must be essential because otherwise you could just get into a, 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 a turbulence of, well, there's so much stuff we should be doing and how do you actually make sure that it does happen? Inevitably, you have to prioritise. So there are certain key things that we're working on at any one time. But there's so much energy in those underlying work streams and people are trying things. And that's, I think, where we will make the most advance. Just a, a quick example, in the ethnicity work stream, there are some individuals there who for many years did not want to be seen as coming from an ethnic minority. They just wanted to be judged on their own merits. But now they're, as they are senior leaders, they realise they need to be role models. Um, and so that's changing people's minds about what it is. What does a senior person in the industry look like? It doesn't have to be that uh, white man anymore. So I think there is change and we want to capture all of that energy in those underlying groups. That's so interesting to hear that because that's that was my story. You know, I, I hated being described as a woman in tech. And, uh, you know, that, that was the story I shared earlier. So and I, and I think... I think you're absolutely right. We've started compiling this this framework, this list of all the things you could do because we wanted to take away the excuse for, oh, I just simply don't know what to do. I can't. I put the job out there and no one applied. They were, you know, so we wanted to take away the excuses, and we've got a list of literally hundreds of things that can be done, and we've we've. We're calling it the onion at the moment where you start at the middle with the leadership and the culture. You then work out to look at the employer experience. You then take a step further out looking at recruitment, so how you get people into your organisation. And then one step further is looking at the ecosystem. So not just thinking about your organisation in isolation, but actually how do you fit in with the ecosystem in the industry? And by by creating this framework and then the various different things that can be done within each of these four categories, we're helping organisations to prioritise, you know, what is it that they're going to do in each of those areas? And, and that, I think that helps to provide both the focus and the direction. And, and what are you optimistic about as you as you look at that sort of framework that you have? Uh, the I love the the onion, uh, the onion of life. <laughs> it's, a, it's a working title. I'm not. I don't know if we'll be keeping that. But, it'll you know, it'll it get w- you crying. <laughs> no, that's not the right way to go. But, but, but I am very interested. In, you know, what what are you optimistic about? So I am optimistic about three things. Firstly, the genuine will to collaborate. I in since I've started diversely, there it really has been so much support and optimism for the work that I've been doing. So that makes me feel very optimistic. The second thing that makes me feel very optimistic is this growing level of awareness. So I talked before about this, you know, awareness plus intent equals change. And I genuinely think that that is changing, that that um, awareness is, is growing. And then the final thing that makes me feel optimistic, which is actually the most important thing, is about the potential um, upside. You know, by creating diverse and inclusive working environments, we create a better businesses, we create better solutions, we create a better industry and we create a better society. So the upside is, is just so up that that makes me feel optimistic. And, and Jay, let me bring you in there. When we think about sort of going back to your original lunch, you know, when you, when you sat there where we started today and, and, and said, you know, where are all the women? Uh, as, you, as you reflect on what's happened since then and look ahead, what are you optimistic about? Well, I've been so impressed by how organisations have engaged with the Diversity Project. Um, It is the easiest sell in the world to go into an organisation and say, don't you want to be part of this? So we now have 50 organisations across asset owners, asset managers, investment consultants, search firms and other organisations all working together. So we've created a, a movement, really, which I'm very excited about that. And I'm also optimistic because the senior leaders are in this as well. So we have an advisory council, which is made up of chief executives of the member firms, and they turn up and they want to engage. They want to share what they've learnt and and what best practice is. They're committed to making a change. And my final point would be, we know we can make a better industry for our clients if we embrace diversity. 
Well, Jane and Marissa, it's been a wonderful conversation today. Thank you both very much for joining us. Thanks, Thank you. Julia. Thanks, Thanks Jane. Jane. This episode of Diversity Podcast was produced by me, Kieran Yates, on behalf of Julia Streets Productions. Thanks to Cynthia Akinsanya and Robert Pinto Fernandez for their insights. You can find out more about the guests on this week's show on our website, diversitypodcast.com, and that's diversity with a C, not an S. Whilst you're there, you can also sign up to our newsletter for all our latest updates. To be sure of catching all our future podcasts, subscribe to our feed in iTunes or your favourite podcast app. And if you've enjoyed this episode of Diversity Podcast, remember to give us a rating or review. It all helps promote the show to a wider audience. Finally, our Twitter handle is at DiversityPod. Thanks for listening. <laughs>